It's great to be joined today by Liz Watson, who's the Democratic nominee running for the U.S. House of Representatives in Indiana's ninth congressional district against the incumbent Republican Trey Hollingsworth. Very interesting race in an interesting part of the country. Uh, Liz, it's so great for you to join us today. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So for people in our audience who may be congregated in coastal cities, tell us a little bit, bit about sort of what are the key issues in, in your particular district? Sure. So first, let me just situate where Indiana's ninth is. So I'm from Bloomington, Indiana, which is a Big Ten university town, Indiana University, home to more than uh, 50,000 students. Uh, and the ninth district spans all the way from the Indianapolis suburbs uh, down to the Kentucky border. So it's very long. It's about two hours, 45 minutes, driving the speed limit, top to bottom. And um, some of the really big issues in this district that we're facing are not being able to afford to fill prescriptions, uh, a terrible opioid crisis that has really swept across our district and, and ravaged families um, and caused a lot of... Uh, Families to be torn apart. Uh, children are being raised by grandparents because their parents can't raise them because they're in the grips of substance abuse. A lot of folks who can't afford the treatment they need to get better. Uh, living wage jobs are a big issue in this district. We've had a lot of deindustrialization, factories that have shut down, uh, making sure that the jobs that people have allow them to earn a living wage and raise their families in with dignity uh, is important to folks in this district. Protecting the institutions that built the middle class, like Medicare and Social Security, very important to people in this district. Making sure that our public schools are strong. Uh, these are the bread and butter issues that keep folks up at night. At this is a state that has leaned very far into the voucher movement that Betsy DeVos has championed. And so our public schools are under attack as our taxpayer dollars are siphoned out uh, to private schools through vouchers. So a few of those issues you mentioned sort of relate to health care. So maybe we could we could talk about that a little bit. Um, you support H.R. 676, the expanded improved Medicare for all act of 2017. Um, even though I'm sure, as, as you know, and much of my audience knows, and, and I understand, the idea is that even though such a program would have costs, that overall it would decrease the total cost, not only to the individual, but also to the government, as a, as a recent report showed. That being said, I'm guessing that in particularly or, or inclusively of uh, states like yours, talking about an additional tax is not necessarily the most popular thing. So can you talk a little bit about sort of how you communicate that even though, yes, there will be some cost for Medicare for all, the savings will exceed that cost. How do you talk about that with people who may have sort of an anti-tax perspective in general? Mm -hmm. Well, I will say I think what's important to remember here is that we can walk and chew gum. Uh, we can shoot for this big vision, which is Medicare for all, which is really where we need to go. And we can also protect the Affordable Care Act, which Trey Hollingsworth voted, my opponent voted to repeal uh, at the same time. We can do both of those things. So um, things like being able to negotiate prescription drug prices under Medicare, just like the VA does, are very important to folks in this district. We still have 48,000 people who are uninsured in our district. Being able to uh, insure those who don't have insurance is so important and not going back to the bad old days when folks with pre-existing conditions couldn't get health care, which is what my opponent wants to do. So, you know, the stories of folks in this district uh, are really just heartbreaking. I, over the weekend, was in Jeffersonville uh, and talked to a woman who I met about uh, maybe six months ago uh, in Harrison County, and she told me about how she was actually a, a lifelong Republican, um, but her sister got sick, and her sister had uh, a, a lot of very serious conditions, and she went to the hospital and tried to get treatment, and they found out she didn't have insurance, and they sent her home the next day with a bottle of aspirin. And when yeah, she- Liz, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but only because we, we don't have an unlimited amount of time. I certainly understand everything you're saying, but my question was more about under Bernie's Medicare for All plan, um, which again, you, you support, he's talking about two point something percent 
income tax on employees and nearly 7 percent on employers. I think that that's okay because there would be so much savings on the back end in terms of insurance premiums, co-pays and co-insurance. But my question was more, how do you talk to red staters about that without the anti-tax reaction? Yeah, I talk about the fact that Medicare is one of the most popular programs we've ever had. We know that when people hit 65 years old, uh, they see an improvement in their health outcomes, even though, you know, in general, as you get older, health outcomes decline. And that's because all of a sudden people have access to health care. Imagine if we all had that throughout our life, all of the preventive maintenance that could be done. We know, actually, the Koch brothers just funded a study that was put out, uh, which basically said, yes, there are savings associated yeah. with Medicare. For all. They didn't intend that to be the outcome, but it was the outcome of the study because it's true. You know, when you cut out uh, all the haggling with health insurance companies, when you allow for the negotiation of drug prices, uh, when you put all of this together, right, you actually have a savings in the aggregate, uh, and and that's what Medicare for all would do. So, you know, when we talk about um, when we talk about costs. It's, it's really important to talk about the ways in which Medicare is actually going to bring down costs and allowing folks to use this very successful program, which has, it's not perfect and should be improved, but which has held costs down over time, will be a significant improvement and cost savings, which the Koch brothers study just confirmed. So the other thing to think about, you know, my opponent uh, voted for the tax law, right? The tax law that blew a $1.5 trillion hole in our deficit and is going to result in millions of people going without insurance over the next decade. And he did that actually to give a $4.5 million tax cut to himself and similar giant tax cuts to the 1% and giant corporations. So if you want to talk about, um, fiscal irresponsibility, then the poster child of that is Trey Hollingsworth, my opponent. He's incredibly irresponsible in saying, you know, he's a guy with a $58 million net worth. He voted to give himself a $4.5 million tax cut, which happened to be the exact same amount he and his dad spent to buy his seat in Congress. So, you know, he now has broken even uh, and he's made it possible for his billionaire class friends to buy another yacht. I think actually a better way to spend taxpayer dollars is on the American public, is on bringing down health care costs, is on investing in our infrastructure, is on our public schools. I don't think that more tax cuts for the mega rich is the right approach. And in fact, I think that is just fiscal irresponsibility at its height. I'm really interested in the topic of uh, gun rights and gun safety, particularly in the Midwest. Uh, over the weekend, I was at Netroots Nation in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I spoke to J.D. Scholten, who's running as a Democrat in Iowa. I spoke to Congressman Tim Ryan, who is currently a congressman in, in Ohio. And we talked about the sort of need to, in some cases, tread kind of lightly in certain parts of the country, including the Midwest, when running as a Democrat on the issue of gun safety. I noticed that on your website, you do list gun safety slash gun rights sort of far down. I think it was like somewhere between 12th and 15th on a list of about 15 different topics. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how you sort of deal with that issue, given the part of the country you're running in? So. I'm from, and my opponent is actually not from Indiana, so I don't think he's as familiar with our gun culture here in Indiana. I am. Okay. Uh, I am from Bloomington. It's where I grew up. We had two guns in my house growing up. Uh, and so I am a strong supporter of Second Amendment rights. And I believe you can support Second Amendment rights, and you can also keep our kids and communities safe. We can, we can do both. Um, we're smart enough to figure that out. So, you know... Uh, hunting is very important around here. Uh, in a lot of our rural communities, the nearest police station isn't close. I talked to a friend of mine who told me about, uh, you know, sometimes when she's going out to her house late at night, she likes to have a gun with her because it's miles and miles from anybody else and she's the only person around. Hmm. Um, so, you know, this is, this is rural Indiana. And uh, we certainly want to protect people's right to own guns, and we also want to keep our kids safe. And I have two kids. I put on a school bus uh, every day. Actually, today is their back to school. Uh, this afternoon, they're going to meet their teachers, and they go to my elementary school where I went growing up. And I want to know that my two kids are going to come home on the bus to me and be safe every single day. That's exactly what every mom and dad across southern Indiana wants. 
and it's what every grandma and grandpa wants, and we're going to make that happen. So it's, as far as specific policies that, that you would include in finding that balance, would you support, do you support 100% universal background checks for all gun sales, regardless of, of where those gun sales are taking place? Of course I do, and, and you know, NRA members support background checks. This is a, a universally uh, supported, uh, almost universally supported proposal. It just makes sense uh, to be able to uh, do a background check on someone before they get a gun, um, and that's something that I strongly support along with uh, the vast majority of Americans, yeah. And then how about as far as restrictions on particular types of firearms that one maybe should not be able to buy? So, I mean, I can go through the full range of things that I support for you, uh, things like raising the age um, to buy a weapon, waiting periods, um, in terms of looking at particular weapons that people might buy. We do know that most of the mass shootings that have occurred have been, have used assault weapons. They've used particular kinds of weapons and that these are weapons that are very effective for gunning down a, a, a whole lot of people really fast. And so we need to be very careful uh, about uh, about that. And, and we know that during the period in which the assault weapons ban was in place, and reminder, it was in place for a decade, uh, uh, we saw a decline in mass shootings. So before the before the ban went into place, there were um, many more mass shootings during the period it was in place. There were a lot fewer. And then when the ban was lifted, there were a lot more. So that's some pretty uh, strong evidence that that ban was effective. Now, the way that it's currently written, the legislation that's pending in Congress, it grandfathers in whatever folks, existing weapons people already have. Um, so it's talking about uh, newly manufactured weapons. And so we wanna make sure, and, and that's something we need to look at, right? Maybe the language in the current legislation isn't perfect. Maybe there are more guns that people need to use and wanna use for hunting, et cetera, that ought to be uh, off that list. I, I That's something I, I have been in um, a lot of conversations with gun owners about, and the way that I go about having these conversations. You know, a lot of my supporters are gun owners. A lot of my supporters are hunters. I say, what do you think? You know, uh, and that's the conversation to be having, right, is to listen to the experts. How do we keep our kids safe and protect our way of life at the same time? And Liz, just to make sure I understand only because you, you said a, a lot of interesting things there. Um, it, th does that mean that from where we are right now going forward, you would be interested in expanding or shrinking the list of firearms that can be legally purchased? I'd be interested in sitting down with gun owners to really understand which of these are very important to, you know, to hunting, huh. uh, to, right, and 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 having that conversation, right, uh, that would be, I think, useful and important. So you, so okay, wow, that's interesting. So so if the case was a compelling case that there were, for example, banned assault weapons that hunters say they want to use, that that might be something you'd consider. So I support the assault weapons ban. It does list a whole lot of weapons. I think that, you know, anybody who's who's diligent in uh, the in signing on to legislation, I would want to go through and understand every single thing that's on that list and, and what it's what its purpose is, what it's mainly used for, uh, et cetera, and make sure that that I'm making a very informed decision. That's a good approach. If only more people actually read what they were what they were signing, I think that that would be uh, it's it's refreshing to hear that that's uh, something you would do. Uh, we've been speaking with Liz Watson, who's the Democratic nominee running for the U.S. House of Representatives in Indiana's ninth congressional district, which, as I'm sure our audience can tell, is a uh, a unique place to be running as a Democrat. As I think our, our conversation has illuminated. Liz, I really appreciate you uh, taking time to talk to me and uh, good good luck in your race against the incumbent Republican Trey Hollingsworth. Well, thank you. I appreciate your time.